Welcome, everyone. I'm Candice Timoteus. I'm with the Partnership to Fight Infectious Disease and an organization called Vaccination. We're thrilled to be co-hosting this webinar in partnership with the South Carolina Legislative Black Caucus. Vaccines for COVID-19 are now readily available across the country, across South Carolina, for adults and children ages 12 and older. Older. So far, more than 150 million people in America have received at least one shot, including nearly 4 million people in South Carolina, and nearly 2 million people in South Carolina are now fully vaccinated. That's a great start, but we have a ways to go. And that includes making sure people have access to accurate information that they need from people that they trust to make an informed decision about getting vaccinated. Um, with vaccination, we're focused on helping people helping to end the pandemic by ensuring that people have access to that the latest, most accurate information about vaccines, treatments for COVID-19, ways to stay safe, and hearing that information directly from people in your community and top experts. In this webinar, we've brought together some of those top experts from South Carolina to share the latest, what's going on in the state, what's going on with vaccination, what's going on with COVID-19, and to answer some key questions that are on the minds of many people, including what's the latest on safety, side effects, what are we hearing, what are this, you know, the variants, um, should I be concerned about that, and other questions that people have before they decide whether or not to roll up their sleeves, or maybe questions people have who've already been vaccinated as well. We welcome all of those, and thank you so much for joining us. To get us started, we have a special message from Representative Patricia Moore Hennigan, who represents District 54 and is the chair of the South Carolina Legislative Black Caucus. Hello, everyone. I'm Patricia Moore Hennigan, South Carolina State Representative and chair of the South Carolina Legislative Black Caucus. I'm happy to be joining you today for this virtual event. Today, we are going to be discussing and answering questions about the COVID-19 vaccines. Getting vaccinated is the most effective way to bring an end to this pandemic. Now, to begin, I'd like to give a quick update on where we currently stand in South Carolina regarding vaccination. As of June 1st, South Carolina has administered 3.4 million vaccine doses and 1.5 residents are fully vaccinated, according to the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. That's about 37% of our state population. We are making progress, but we know that we still have more work to get to as many South Carolina vaccinated as quickly as possible. This remains true and our communities of color. DHEC reported that of the 1.9 million residents who have received at least one dose of the vaccine, 19% are black and only 4% are Hispanic or Latinos. And in South Carolina today, everyone aged 12 and older is now eligible to receive their COVID-19 vaccine. That's great news, great, great news. The available vaccines were developed following all FDA requirements. They are safe and effective. Further, the vaccine clinical trials were more di diverse than many past trials and involved thousands and thousands of volunteers from diverse backgrounds. Without a doubt, getting vaccinated against COVID-19 is the best way to protect ourselves and our loved ones from serious illness or death. We have already lost too many to this terrible disease and getting vaccinated is a chance to get back to doing all the things that we love and miss. I'm sure that many of you have questions about the vaccine and our aim today is to help answer them. I'm pleased to join, but be joined by a panel of experts who can address questions about safety, side effects, and vaccine rollout in communities of color. I want to thank the Partnership to Fight Infectious Disease for hosting us today. I look forward to continuing these important conversations with experts and stakeholders so we all stay aware of the threats posed by infectious diseases. I also want to extend my gratitude to each of you 
who are doing your part to keep South Carolina safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you to those who have already received a vaccine. Together, let's make sure that we are sharing trust and accurate information to keep our families and our communities safe. But before we get to the panel discussion, I would like to ask my colleague, Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter, to say a few words. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for that great message. And Representative Cobb Hunter, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, let me say good morning to all of you. Uh, I am pleased to be a part of this conversation. Uh, you've heard from the leader of the South Carolina Legislative Black Caucus, and I'd like to bring you uh, greetings from the National Black Caucus of State Legislators, a, a national group of Black legislators from across the country of which I am the uh, immediate past chair. And just to tell you a couple of things very quickly about NBCSL and what we did as far as COVID-19. During my tenure as president of NBCSL, the pandemic really took root and really uh, just, and is still, uh, racing across the country. What we decided to do at NBCSL is to create a work group so that we could help legislators from around the country help their constituents. Early on, it became clear that the pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, was affecting communities of color more so than other communities. There are a lot of reasons for that, uh, none of which we have time to go into detail here this morning. But quite frankly, when we think about marginalized communities, when we think about things that impact communities, it is a no brainer that marginalized communities will always be affected or impacted disparately uh, from other communities. Some of the issues we dealt with and some that are still ongoing, and that's why I'm so pleased to be a part of the conversation today with a partnership to fight infectious disease. There are a lot of myths and misconceptions in communities of color about not just the COVID-19, but about vaccines in general. Some of you on the call, and uh, I know are familiar, and I, I see uh, Rosalind Goodwin from the Hospital Association, you're well-versed and very familiar with the health disparities. And what we find with COVID-19 is nothing that is different from that. What I am hopeful that we can do, those of us who live in red states in particular, is figure out how we can go the extra mile to make sure our communities are vaccinated. Uh, Chairwoman Hennigan gave you the statistics of South Carolina's vaccination rate. Those stats are certainly nothing that we ought to be proud of. There are still gaps across this state and communities that are not being served. And so there is still much work to do. Uh, what I wish we could figure out is how we depoliticize this issue. And that's the, that's the task that nobody has figured out yet because the whole politicization around wearing masks or not wearing masks has led to numbers in our communities being low. What some of us are doing here in South Carolina is looking at rural access in particular, working through mobile health units, community uh, federally qualified health centers, hospitals, everybody who wants to be a part of vaccinating communities can be a part of it and is a part of it. But we can't stop there, y'all, because what is true is that we've got to have more creative thinking of how we reach communities. We've got to get past this notion that if we build it, they will come. And so we see the slowdown in vaccination rates. We see that the big mega drives, uh, sites rather, are losing steam, have lost steam, certainly here in South Carolina. And so I'm ready for us to do what they're doing in some other states, and that is going to the communities. We've got to figure out how to use metrics, uh, how to overlay uh, data that says 
where the gaps are and target those communities for a creative way of, of um, doing this. There are states, New York, New Jersey, and some other states that are using visiting nurses um, who make home visits to be a part of the vaccination program. And I really think that's why New York's rate uh, was so high. But at any rate, the experts are on here. I am trying to stay in my lane. Uh, my, my instructions was to simply bring you greetings uh, and to thank you all for taking the time to be a part of this conversation. Not sure who all is on the line and future visits to this webinar. Please understand that there is a role that each of us can play. It is not rocket science. You know somebody who knows somebody who's not been vaccinated. Let's have some real conversations with those people, some of whom may well include your family members, and stress the importance of getting vaccinated. So I look forward to the conversation and thank you again for what you already have done and what you will do. This is a Herculean task, but I think if we all remember that phrase, the best way to eat an elephant is one small bite at a time, we'll be able to lick this. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us and thank you so much for your continued leadership, both in South Carolina and then also through the caucus at the national level. Thank you. Um, before we dive into questions, I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce our other panelists. Uh, Rosalind Goodwin is Vice President of Engagement at the South Carolina Hospital Association. And in that role, she serves as the primary link with many private and public sector stakeholders, including policymakers, community and advocacy groups, insurers, and employers across the state. Um, also joining us is Dr. Evan Johnson, who's a pharmacist. She's a native of Columbia, South Carolina, and um, earned her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from College of Charleston. Stayed in South Carolina for her Doctor of Pharmacy degree at Presbyterian College um, School of Pharmacy in Clinton, South Carolina, and currently serves as the pharmacist in charge at Nephron Pharmacy, um, which is an in-house employee retail pharmacy in West Columbia. Also joining us is Bambi Gaddis. Um, she is the Chief Executive Officer at South Carolina HIV Council and is a COVID Prevention Network um, Faith Ambassador. So we're really interesting, looking forward to learning more about that as well in terms of outreach. Um, so let's jump right in with some questions. Um, Bambi, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. We talked about, um, uh, Representative talked about uh, using some creative ways to reach the community and get people where they live in, in a trusted environment. Tell us more about this faith ambassador work that you're doing and, and what you're seeing in the communities, how people are responding. First of all, yes, sure. thank you for inviting me. I, um, so, uh, June of last year, probably at the height of hysteria, when uh, COVID fit, uh, first, you know, uh, really started to manifest in a, in a ma major way. Um, I was approached by one of my mentors and uh, national leaders who's been engaged with the CO-VPN Prevention Network uh, through Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, uh, their house in Seattle. And um, our agency, the Right Wellness Center, had already started to collaborate uh, to, with DHEC to provide uh, free uh, COVID testing. And so as we continue to test uh, our community, uh, along with other integrated services, we saw something evolving. And one of the things that we started to respond to was an increased number of faith-based leaders who needed intervention because of potential exposures that were playing themselves out as they were deciding whether they were gonna to continue to convene. And since June of last year, outside of the offering of testing, I've been one of seven ambassadors asked uh, and selected uh, to engage the community in a series of public forums educational uh, forms to help them understand what the vaccines were, what they are not, um, how the clinical trials were coordinated, um, really trying to dispel a lot of mythology that this is something new, but really a add on to a, a historical a legacy of research that's been going on for some time, but going on unfunded. And so, uh, we have evolved, I'll say in closure, that our mission as faith ambassadors is to engage clergy, faith leaders, 
uh, wherever they sit um, in conversations and how do we get to the masses uh, because the faith community serves such a vital role in, in getting to certain communities, uh, particularly uh, communities of color. And so I'll say in closure that um, this work is evolving. When we first started, it was all about education and it remains that. But since the vaccines are now uh, a, a source and a remedy uh, with reducing illness and death, um, the, it has changed. And so we all here know that vaccine hesitancy is high priority. And that's part of why we're meeting today to have that conversation. You raise a great point about hesitancy because now, uh, you know, early on it was there weren't enough vaccines to go around and people are clamoring to figure out where to go. Now we have um, excess vaccines or ready access um, for many, not everyone. And I know that's another gap we need to talk about. Um, but hesitancy is driving a lot of that. Um, Rosalind, I'd love to hear from you in terms of hospital outreach and what you're seeing and hearing um, when it comes to hesitancy and reaching out in the communities that you're serving. Absolutely. Again, uh, thank you for this invitation uh, to share on behalf of the hospital as well as myself personally, and I'll get to that later. Uh, but what our South Carolina hospitals have seen most success, and of course they're seeing as all of the providers are now a decline um, and increased hesitancy related to uh, people receiving and wanting the vaccine. Uh, we had early success with mass vaccination events. Um, so I'm thinking of some that were hosted by some of our largest systems, McLeod Health, uh, Prisma Health, um, partnering with the uh, Darlington Motor Raceway uh, and having those that people can literally drive through and, and get those vaccines. Um, partners also in the Midlands, um, partnering with uh, the National Guard and, and others to have those very easily accessible drive-through vaccinations. So those were certainly uh, successful at that time. I think what we've seen is just this relaxation um, as cases have gone down that you know, I, I, I talk with people and I'm actually out of the state right now and people from who are outside of the South um, have come here and they're looking like, you know, the, the COVID like just go away just in the South. There's just so much relaxation with masks and everything else. Um, and it, it, um, I, I can't emphasize enough what uh, Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter mentioned about the politicization of, of this whole matter and how just any decrease in cases or numbers or deaths um, has almost emboldened people to disregard that we still are in a pandemic. Um, and that has certainly impacted the numbers of people showing up uh, for these events. Um, and, and quite frankly, there are a number of hospitals who can't continue to dedicate the resources to having these up and running every single day. Uh, so it really has put our, a number of our hospitals in a, a bind of position that we can't have the staff being at these stations when people don't show up. Uh, so there's definitely got to be more partnerships. Uh, I'm looking forward to us discussing and, and um, strategizing on how, how all of these different partners and people together in the state can work more collaboratively. Uh, because there's just so much at stake. Uh, when I got the in, the email invitation, I uh, I ignored it, I, I'll honestly say, uh, for the first couple of days. Um, because, you know, when the, when the pandemic hit, it really, to me, was something, of course, impacting my community more than other communities. And I was a healthcare professional. But on January 7th, I went to go wake up my best friend of 37 years, godmother of my two children, um, a maid of honor who had been struggling with COVID and I found her dead. Um, so this has a, a whole different meaning, um, uh, uh, personal mission for me now. Um, no known pre-existing conditions. Uh, we just totally 
sucker punch, just blindsided at no inclination that that is what I would find that day. Um, but I am not alone. I, I know so many people and we will talk about a number of stats today. But if you all are listening, I heard the, the most disturbing one is one I heard some months ago. But like nine out of 10 black Americans have had some type of personal dealing with COVID personal enough that they've lost a family member, struggled themselves, and it's not like that in other communities. And I I can't stress enough how important it is for our community to be vaccinated. I, I literally know families who lost a, a father and a sister. I know a young man who's lost his mom and his dad. I, I know a family who the mother passed away and the son, all from COVID. Um, so I don't know who's listening, who's going to listen later. The conversations that I'm having with people who look like me um, are sometimes frustrating. And we've got to have some of these really frank conversations like I'm having with people. I've literally told people, you so woke, you sleep. Why are you overanalyzing a vaccine if you get the flu shot. And I mean, we've got, we had much more of a diverse, um, the, 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 the rounds, the testing and everything else is impacting us more than anybody else. Uh, so I, I really hope that this conversation ignites and starts more of us having more frank conversations and, and figuring out, you know, how do we, pull these pieces together and make sure that our community is vaccinated. And I am all for uh, one thing that I think has been lacking has just been this general, we all need to pull up our sleeves and we all need to get vaccinated. No, right now, um, my focus is black people need to get vaccinated. People of color need to be vaccinated. And if I could just add something, if you look at those of us that have had an opportunity to be on this uh, panel, um, to some, there's something missing. And what's missing are Black men. Hmm. Um, They have not been engaged in this conversation. There is a high level of vaccine hesitancy. uh, As you can see, I have no hair. So I don't go to a hairstylist, but I go to a barber. And, and I typically engage black men in an open forum about uh, their ideas and thoughts about this vaccine. And there is certainly work that must be done. Um, and we, even when we look at the faith community and the hierarchy, many are men. And so part of how one of the uh, strategies as you talk about what the strategies are going to have to look like is that we have to create some new incentive other than offering um, uh, lottery tickets and new cars uh, to engage black men in this conversation so they see the relevance in their positioning in their family. Because no one's really talking about all the black men that have died from COVID. When, to your point, one thing that really concerns me, and Evan, I wanna get you to jump in on this if you don't mind, is when you see, like we talk in general numbers about 37% of South Carolinians have been vaccinated, but then when you take a, when you take a deeper dive, what does that look like for black men? What does that look like for you know communities of color? And the challenge is they've um, already seen a disproportionate impact of COVID and devastating impact of COVID, not just numbers, but deaths, hospitalizations. So if those pockets and those communities continue to be unvaccinated as COVID, COVID's not going away. I mean, we know that it's decreasing because the vaccination rates, but it's going to continue to devastate those families and those communities. Evan, what are you seeing in your practice? What kind of questions are you getting and and what are you doing to kind of help people understand the impacts and, and, you know, why vaccination is so important? Uh, Yes. uh, Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm in a really um, interesting position here at Nephron because for me, being in the retail pharmacy, um, I see employees, you know, all the time. And for us at Nephron, 
they really championed um, starting a vaccination clinic. And so they have an offsite vaccination clinic that they partner with Dominion to help vaccinate everyone. Anyone can go. And at this point, they vaccinated over 13,000 people at this point to date. Um, so they're really making a huge impact in the community. But most of my questions that I get aren't necessarily from people who come in to work because, you know, they know that vaccines are available here at Nephron. You, they're easily accessible um, to this small, you know, population of employees. My questions and, you know, comments and conversations typically come from family members and friends, you know, about my take on it or what do I think or, you know, is it right for me? Is it trustworthy? Um, so for me, you know, I have a lot of friends, family members who are frontline workers, who are educators, um, and who have, you know, taken a step to do their part and get vaccinated and I always let them know that, you know, for me, getting vaccinated means being able to get back to things that we enjoy doing, being able to see each other and, and hug each other. Um, and just thinking about a personal experience of mine this past year, you know, my 13 year old being in eighth grade and being completely virtual his eighth grade year, no eighth grade social, no, you know, I'm thinking about all the things that I was able to enjoy at 13, my last year in middle school, feeling like a senior in middle school that he did not get the opportunity to take a part in and he'll never get that time back. So my talk in, you know, just letting them know about having confidence in the science and, you know, doing their part is like, we have to make sure that we're protecting everyone that we love and that we're doing what we need to do so that we can get back to the things that we enjoy. Candace, mm -hmm. um, uh, Evan brings a, a critical uh, piece uh, to the table. Um, uh, prior to the uh, onset of this uh, webinar, uh, I spoke with one of your colleagues about sharing some information. I, I was invited to a, a local um, a career center here uh, several weeks ago and met 60 approximately 60 students. They were 11th and 12th graders. Um, and, and prior to meeting them, I had pilot tested a survey I was planning to administer to them to my grandson who was 13. And what I learned from him, not only did it translate in me making some changes to the survey, but then I went about into this cohort of 58 students and I brought some of that data with me. It's on, I don't know if you can share the screen. It's a one page, just a, a quick and dirty at a glance. But I think as we talk about uh, not just adults who are resistant, we are gonna have, we have a new challenge before us. What are we gonna do with the young adults who are turning up, continuing to turn up and this upcoming group of young people who are now leaving to go to college with no knowledge, no conversation, virtual learning, and what, and I'd like to share briefly what, because I think it's, it, it forces us to look to the future of not only the here and the now, but what are we going to do with this young group of people? So if, if, if you'll give me one second and allow me just to pull it up, where did it go? Here it goes. Um, it, can you see that? Yes. It's called, I called it turning up or tuning out. So very briefly, there were 58 students in this group. They ranged from 16 to 19. As you can see, most of them were African-American or black. Here's some, and I, and I showed it to my grandson on the way to his summer school event. And I asked him, what do you think about what you saw? And so the insights are following. 52% of the students that I surveyed did not have, could not tell me if they, or remember if they ever had been vaccinated before. So we all know that we had to go to school and get vaccinations, but this conversation about previous history of vaccinations has never occurred with our young people, not even in science. So they can't reflect on anything. Now they remembered polio, they remembered the flu, but those initial vaccinations we all had, they don't remember whether they had them. 55% were not concerned 
or moderately concerned about getting it. And this is really important when you look at some of these other factors. 57% do not plan to, or they're unsure if they're, that they were gonna get vaccinated. 60% reported an immediate family member that had COVID and, and some of them themselves had COVID or they had multiple family members who uh, contracted COVID. That really is somewhat, not just interesting, but disturbing that, that despite it being right there in their own families and being personal, personally susceptible that they still don't feel a compelling need. 48% reported that the majority of their households had not been vaccinated. And so I asked them, well, what are your top reasons for not wanting or thinking it's important? And they said, one, and this is majority, uh, most likely reasons that were given. They believed that they were immune, which again is misinformation about them being able to get it because they already had it. They were scared or they weren't sure, which means again, education, what should we be doing with young folks to increase their knowledge about what these vaccines are and are not. Um, haven't had COVID yet and they're not worrying about getting it. Worrying about side effects, again, education. Believe the vaccine came out too quickly. We know that this work has been going on for decades, for at least 12 years. Again, misinformation, and then worried that they were gonna be test dummies. And so the, the, these students were totally capable of having the conversation. Um, but just as a final note, 83% of the students were unvaccinated out of that 58. 60% of them knew someone who in their media family, 56% of the unvaccinated um, had most of their family or household had been not vaccinated and then set 46% of unvaccinated students did not believe or they were unsure if their parents would let them. And so I think that, you know, those kind of overarching concepts are things we can really dig into. Our school districts, I looked at these health books, they're outdated. They need to be updated to include this content. Um, and that's just the beginning of things. And how do we penetrate not just the knowledge base, but the attitudes and beliefs and the misinformation that clearly if I administer this across a bigger group of young people, we might have even more credence to uh, trying to come up with new strategies. Most of them go to, to are using social media to get their information. Right, including their healthcare information, which we know is not accurate. So, so how do we start eating this elephant? What what would be some good? I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that want to help understand that there's an issue, but I think, um, to your point, where are the black men? You know, how who are the influencers that we need to get engaged in this conversation? To, to make to make those that penetration and and you know you're talking about multiple generations I'm sure if you surveyed the parents you probably wouldn't be far off from that maybe even the grandparents and aunts and uncles and everything else so how do we start eating that elephant Rosalind why don't we start with you in terms of healthcare providers what role do they have do they play in this I think healthcare providers play the role um, we need to play a better role of, of convening all the different parties together. Um, I, I think we've got the, the influence to do that. Uh, the, the, the issue that I'm seeing, and I, I think it's political again too, because COVID has not um, and is not impacting certain communities like it's impacting other communities, those um, in political or economic power uh, just don't have the, from what I gather, and this is all personal. If I had on a name badge, I would take it off right now. Um, the, the, the will is, is just not there. Um, and that is, that is frustrating. Um, so I, I think we've got to convene and pull together those who do have influence and some level of, of power um, who've got a vested interest 
whether they're healthcare providers, larger systems, um, with those who are personally impacted and, and still, you know, wanting to be in this fight. Um, there have certainly been actions in the last week um, that have made some people question in our state whether this is a priority anymore. Um, so we, we've, we've got to pull together those who still believe that it is a priority um, with those who have some type of influence uh, and, and convene them and, and, and figure out a way to um, reach some of these groups. But it, it, is, it will take not only will, but I believe it will take some funding. It will, it will take some coordinated efforts to not only strategize, but implement. And I think that is kind of what's been lacking at this point. You raise a great point too, and Representative Cobb Hunter, if you don't mind, I'd love to come back to you. How do we overcome the, you know, we've seen like at income levels, race, socioeconomic factors, you know, higher education, a lot more penetration in terms of vaccination. Um, and these are the people in power that Rosalind's talking about. How do we make sure that policymakers continue to prioritize communities that have lower vaccination rates with funding, with outreach, that it's not just, well, they, you know, well, they've decided not to get vaccinated or, you know what I'm saying that you don't, mm -hmm. you don't quit. We're not out of this and we got to make sure everybody has that opportunity, but how do we keep people engaged and interested in helping people? Well, let me first say to, to Roth and I am so sorry for your loss. Um, that that's 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 I'm I'm sorry you had to be the one to find your friend. I feel your pain. The, that's the sixty-four dollar question, uh, Candace is and I'm sitting here listening. I think it's important for us not to give the impression that while our numbers are low here in South Carolina, that nothing is being done. You've heard examples of what is being done. I think the problem is there is not leadership matters and the lack of leadership matters even more. A part of our problem here in South Carolina is that we still continue to have people who work in silos, who don't share information. There are such territorial issues here depending on where you are in the community. For example, there are parts of the state where there are groups working with specifically with men who need to be educated. And some of that is being taken on by other black men. And so what I believe is important to tackling this issue is for us to set a different mission for our public health agency, for example, to build on partnerships and collaboratives that we've not taken advantage of. I am just one who doesn't believe too much in having a pity party. Uh, I can't afford to quit. I can't afford to take the attitude, oh, well, they don't, they don't want to listen or whatever. And so I think it's important for us to have some kind of asset inventory, if you will, of what is out there, what is being done, who's doing it. A lot of times when we talk about the faith community, we are not embracing the entire range of different faiths in our community. And so there is work that needs to be done there. Um, one of the things, and, and I'm putting on my legislative hat now and tell you how difficult it is to get emails from parents who are upset because a higher ed, a college or university wants to require their children to be immunized before they come on campus. And, you know, we're inundated with all of these emails talking about how unfair it is and their kids victim. I had to chuckle at one email that a parent told me that her son had done the research online and he knew that the vaccine was not safe and blah, blah, blah. And because he had COVID, all of that kind of stuff. What that perspective fails to take into account are those parents who have taken the time to have their child vaccinated, their family vaccinated, 
um, and what it means to their child to go on a campus where people have not been, been vaccinated. I agree with the sentiment that here in this state, the relaxing of rules and regulations has really just gone, it's almost taken a life of its own because the numbers are going down. People are not paying attention. Uh, I am very much concerned about the virus, uh, the variant rather, that has creeped up, has been identified, I think Delta. the Delta uh, variant. And so, but you know, when you think about people in positions of power, who are decision makers, you have to keep in mind that a lot of us are about as ignorant on this issue as the people we represent. When you add Rosalind's point about how spinally challenged people in positions of power are, and by that, uh, for those of you who may not know what I mean by spinally challenged, I mean you ain't got no spine, you're just weak and won't make the tough decisions. So I think I've started rambling, Candace. The way to, to do this, I believe, is to just do it, to be creative, to understand that there is no cookie cutter approach to this issue. And Rosalind's point about the resources that are being exhausted by hospitals and the federally qualified centers to host these drives and nobody shows up is one that we've really got to pay attention to. Because what that says to me is we need to stop, those of us who are legislators need to stop imposing on hospitals and healthcare systems that they host these drives when we're not doing our part to educate our constituents to say, hey, there's going to be this drive, please go. There's, we just need to do a lot more than what we're doing. And again, I say that each of us should look in the mirror and figure out what our little contribution can be and should be. It doesn't have to be major. It can be as simple as learning about the vaccine and talking to your neighbor. Start with your family. And somebody has made the point about Black families, Brown families being intergenerational, multi-generational. So you've got all these households in one family. And I'll just close by saying this. I am very, very concerned about the disparate impact on Black people, but I am also concerned about that disparate impact on the Hispanic community and the community that know that very few people ever think about or talk about is the Native American community and the impact this virus is having on reservations. And here in South Carolina, where we have a significant Native American population that is hidden, okay, it's a, it's a real issue. So I guess I'll say the way we do it <laughs> to come back full circle is to just do it. Figure out which piece of this we feel comfortable in taking, whether it's dispelling the myths. I like to remind people, a sister invented this, uh, uh, discovered rather, this virus. So, you know, if, if, if I'm looking at who discovered it, I'm feeling okay. And everybody brings up the Tuskegee uh, experiment, but the difference in the Tuskegee experiment and the COVID-19 vaccine is that treatment was withheld from those folk involved in the Tuskegee uh, uh, experiment. They weren't trying to treat the syphilis. Here with this vaccine, the difference it's people are trying to, it's a treatment. It's a part of a treatment plan. So I hope that answers your question. Probably uh, didn't, but eh, it made sense to me. Thanks. No, absolutely. And it's not, it's not an easy fix, but I love right. that, you know, we just have to do it. And certainly we, uh, you know, encouraging everyone to have a role to play. Maybe the one conversation with a neighbor, maybe you're checking out with your groceries and you're talking to somebody. Right. But, or you're Bambi and you're getting your hair cut and you're talking to the guy next to you about, hey, have you been vaccinated? Have you thought about this? Um, Evan, I know that pharmacists have a real opportunity because they're out there in the communities and easily accessible. What um, what are pharmacists doing and, and what role do you see that they could play to kind of help with this outreach? Even if somebody's not there, they're picking up their prescription, they have high blood pressure. We know that puts them at higher risk for COVID. So what 
you know, opportunities are there there in the community pharmacies? Oh, there are several. I mean, because a lot of times um, people see their pharmacists more than they see their physicians and they trust them and they talk to them about their lives and their families. Um, So it's very easy to, you know, be that integral part in sharing the information and, you know, answering any questions and dispelling myths. So there's so much good work that can be done in the communities by pharmacists. And just to input, I feel like it also adds an extra layer by having somebody who's a professional that looks like you. Um, It's very difficult sometimes just based on history and everything that's been presented in black and brown communities. Sometimes there is distrust, you know, sometimes, you know, there is hesitancy because there's not always trust there. So um, I'll just say like today, this morning, I was on um, Facebook and an ad popped up for the CDC. And for young people that watch like the Real Housewives or Trash TV or Married to Medicine, things like that. There was um, one of the doctors who's an OBGYN. She was actually saying, hey, I know several people who have gotten the vaccine. It's safe and it's effective. You know, you should get it too to protect your families. You know, go to the CDC for information. So things like that, just having, you know, information out there for people that look like them, you know, and also just, starting the conversation, answering the questions, or even asking, like, you know, what are your reservations? What are you concerned about? You know, what can I help you understand more? So it's, it's available, it's in your face. And um, I think pharmacists really do have a big opportunity to help in this whole mission. And I love your suggestion about not being afraid to ask questions, because there's so much misinformation. And you may hear something and you're like, that didn't sound right. Um, it's good to ask, you know, don't just assume and don't, don't get your medical information from TikTok. Or I guess. Right. Dr. There's so much of that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll also say that there's a lot of people that, you know, I guess it can be anyone, but I know certainly like just black and brown people, even if they aren't necessarily getting it from a reliable source, it could be like secondhand information and they're telling everybody they know. So a lot of their information comes from the streets and it's not accurate, you know, so it's, it's That's really good the to even university of the street. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we need to really need to, you know, take that into account too and ask the question. So a lot of times like, well, where do you hit it from? You know, or, oh, that's good. you know, things like mm-hmm. that. Great point. Um, I know we're running short of time, not short of topics to talk about, but I did want to give each of you an opportunity if there's one key message that people watching today or watching the recording later would walk away from this webinar um, and taking away um, that would help them or help their families, I want to give you each an opportunity to say, what what would you want them to walk away with? Um, Representative Cod Punder, do you mind if we start with you? <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't, but uh, the, uh, the message I would say is, uh, you know, just to, well, real quickly, do something. But <laughs> based on what Dr. Johnson just pointed out, get the right information first. You know, know what you know that you're passing on the right information and then pass it on. The, <laughs> this stuff is deadly. And as somebody from the government, don't wait for the government to come riding in on a white horse to save you, because that's not going to happen. Save yourself. Find out what this is about, and you get busy sharing accurate information with your family and your friends. You know what? There are a whole lot of things that may not be pleasant about COVID, but guess what? Dying is worse. Thank you for that. Rosalind? I'd like to echo that. Those of goodwill, do do what you can, do, um, do your part. I want to publicly shout out MUSC Health. Um, and while healthcare providers and, and hospital systems can't make people come uh, to these uh, stations that have been set up, They have gone the extra mile with a statewide campaign 
a public relations campaign. Um, and I'm saying statewide, but they are specifically targeting smaller rural areas, local newspapers, um, you know, PSAs and, and television commercials. Um, so it's an example of we have this level of influence that we can be a voice to help educate people about this vaccine. Okay, what can we do? Of course, people listening right here may not be in MUSC Health, but you have a level of influence in your sphere of influence that you can impact your friends. You know, you shouldn't be texting people every day and they not be vaccinated or y'all not have a conversation about it anyway, um, that you can't help clarify those things and, and having a conversation about that you've been vaccinated. You know, maybe you've not even publicly shared it because you wouldn't sure what people would say in the comments on Facebook. Um, but let people know that my whole family's been vaccinated. We are fine um, because I think what we're seeing is when we log on to social media, we're seeing all of the people who had a bad second dose in all the comments, but nobody's saying I, I got vaccinated. I had no side effects. I'm doing wonderful. Um, so even if it's you doing that today, posting on social media, I'm vaccinated. My whole family is, we were totally fine. We had no side effects in the post. Uh, we just need to talk about it more, have those conversations. And all of us have, um, should be emboldened and empowered after this conversation, especially if you are in a community of color to do something today. Great message. Evan, why don't we start with you and we'll give Bambi the final word. Yes, I um, just really want to say, you know, like Representative Cobb Hunter said, just do something. You know, I really believe um, you are the change that you seek. You know, take the steps to, you know, make the decision and the choice to get vaccinated, to talk to others about it. You know, I, I kind of want to uh, shout out my husband, Dr. Jermaine Johnson. He's represented for District 80, and he has done so much good work in our community about educating others. Um, he is a master of social media, so he puts out posts like, hey, this clinic is available. There's testing available. Um, you know, when he got vaccinated, hey, look, everybody, I got vaccinated. You can do it, too. So just making, you know, the effort to let people know that you, we can do this together. You know, just take the steps and let's do something to like get rid of this situation and get the numbers under control and get back to everything we enjoy doing. So that's my take. Terrific. Bambi? Yes, um, in closure, uh, one, I would uh, certainly invite people to go to the covpnpreventionnetwork.com uh, there they will find not only a host of information that's up to date and research based, but they would also uh, be able to get access to flyers and other things that they can disseminate. Um, certainly, I want to uh, uh, give kudos to uh, the Partnership to, to Fight Chronic Diseases for continuing to move this agenda forward. Um, I would say that our leadership um, I think there's a, there's a call for us to move beyond the medical model. It's great that hospitals and FQHCs are seen as viable uh, resources, but there are community-based organizations uh, throughout the state that, uh, with the with the vision, uh, should be integrated. Uh, especially those with mobile units uh, like Wright Wellness Center who have opportunities to serve uh, but don't have resources and manpower, but with the right resources could actually be vehicles. Um, the final thing I would say, I've been working, uh, you know, when I went to USC to get a doctorate in public health, it was driven by a desire to address issues like this one. Um, I've spent my entire career working in HIV and there are many lessons that we have learned um, that can be translated into this COVID epidemic. And so uh, my final closing remark is that we look at, revisit, and get uh, both political, uh, both county, city, and state um, support to ensure that everyone is included and that the politics stay out of the formulary. Terrific, all great messages. And I love that let's all, we all have a role to play. And um, as a fellow Southerner, I, you know, community is so important. 
and, and, you know, in the South. And it's so, you know, here's an opportunity for us to work together as a community and help your neighbors, help yourself and help your neighbors. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you um, to Representative Patricia Moore Henneman for, uh, Hennigan for our opening message. Um, Representative Cobb Hunter, thank you so much. Rosalind Goodwin, um, Dr. Evan Johnson and Bambi Gaddis, thank you all for all the continued work you do. And um, thank you for joining us today to answer these questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for what y'all are doing. And an added shout out for MUSC and everything they've been doing statewide. They have been really great. Stay yep. safe, everybody. Stay safe. Great. Thank you. <laughs>